Welcome adventurers, what's going on guys? My name is Cody, this is Taking 20, a channel about all things role-playing games, and today I wanted to do something a little bit different. So, this past weekend I ended up running a charity stream for Mike, I ran a game during his charity stream, Mike with Unmade Gaming, uh, let me just... Uh, let me just pop down here so you guys can actually see this. Uh, so we ran this charity stream, and this was for Extra Life. And uh, it was a 12-hour stream that Mike was doing. He was doing four different games in three-hour blocks. So he asked me, hey, can you run a game? I said, no problem. Can I invite some of my friends? And then uh, we had a great time. So uh, in this game, I I was the Dungeon Master. We had uh, Jim Davis with WebDM. We had Andrew Armstrong with Don Forgecast. We had Jordan with Forgotten Realms Explained. And of course, Mike was playing in this game because it was his stream. And that poor man played for 12 hours for charity. So kudos to you, Mike. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this dungeon. Because, uh, again, part of, the, part of the nuance to creating this dungeon was is I had to try to keep it to that as close to that three hour window as possible. So, you know, and typically we, even if you're creating a one shot, you know, if you go a little bit over, you go a little bit under, it's not a big deal, but because this had to be as close to three hours without, you know, going terribly far over, uh, it, it was an, it was a different challenge for me to try to plan out and guess how long each of these encounters were going to take. And so this is what I came up with. I came up with this, this little four encounter dungeon here. And uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to walk you guys through kind of my thought process in its creation and uh, show off some of the encounters that I came up with. And hopefully that will inspire you guys in your games, steal some of this, steal all of it, whatever you want to do. So to set the tone, I wanted to get right into the action. So I told the players a very simple background. This was not going to be a story driven game. This was going to be a puzzle dungeon in essence. So very simple and clean. The players were hired by their guild to go down and investigate some issues. And I, all this was in before the, like right at the beginning of the game, we didn't really go through any of this during our three hour window. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. There's been some blight. There's an ancient tomb discovered everybody we send in. They're not coming back. There you go. There's your story. Okay. So, when the players arrived, they basically showed up and they entered into a portal. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this portal was just to kind of set the tone for the dungeon that once you are in here, you're in here. To kind of give them that little bit of a claustro claustrophobic feeling uh, for this particular dungeon. And so as we... Let me, let me just kind of zoom in here a little bit and we can kind of go through this dungeon one by one. By the way, uh, this entire thing was created in Dungeon Painter Studio. Yes, they are a sponsor for Saber Dice. They are not sponsoring this video. I just, I know I'm going to get that. Hey, where, how'd you make that map? I made it in Dungeon Painter Studio, which I'm a, I've been a big fan of for uh, almost a year now. So the players come in and they walk into this main room. Now, the purpose for this room when I was designing this was to, to do a, a few things. First off, this is dynamically lit right here, so they actually can't see this. This To them, this looks just like a nice little wall. Uh, but they have a door on each side of the room, and in the middle, they have a, a big stone statue holding out two hands. And what I wanted to do with this is continue to set that tone, and I wanted to use this to give a little bit of a history to the dungeon, a little bit of a purpose to the dungeon to kind of draw the players in instead of being like, okay, haha, we're playing a charity stream to really kind of draw them into a little bit more of a story, even though we weren't doing a lot of heavy role play to set up and go talk to the King and have them, you know, go down and discover the tomb and do all that stuff. Even though we kind of fast forwarded that I didn't want to cheapen the fact of, Hey, the, yes, this dungeon does in fact have a story and a purpose. So when the players arrive here, they are basically greeted by a ghostly message. And the way that this message talks to them is very odd. He basically communicates to them as though he's talking at them more than to them. Uh, so he, he basically addresses them like he is like they are his children, like they are his sons. That's kind of what they're inferring here. And uh, that this dungeon was created as a test. And so I, I thought this was a really nice way to set the tone here and give a little bit of a story to the dungeon. It's also that kind of nice entrance way into the dungeon where, okay, we're about to get into things. Things are picking up. The intensity is picking up. Uh, 
but we're not like the very first room. We're not, we're not, you know, rolling initiative. And what I liked about this was, is that this gave them choice. So a big thing that I like to do is I like to give direction with a choice. You, yes, you're in a dungeon. Yes, you need to complete the dungeon. But ultimately, you want to give your players a little bit extra freedom and a little bit extra choice, and that can go for a long way. So over this side uh, of the doorway was the word dark. Over this side was the word intellect, if I remember correctly. And again, that's going back into that foreshadowing thing that I talk a lot about here on the channel. Just a simple, clean, crisp way to foreshadow that, hey, you know, something over here is going to use intellect. It's probably going to be a puzzle. Okay, so over here was the first thing I wanted to do, uh, for this wing anyways, and that is to create a social encounter. I knew that the players were gonna have a lot of opportunity in this game to kill things. They were gonna have a, a couple of puzzles and things that they needed to figure out. But I wanted to do is I wanted to create some form of social interaction, some form of an NPC, uh, rather than just, hey, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, all the role play's gonna be in between the players only, and go kill things. I wanted to give them a little bit of a sense of a, of a social interaction. So I knew I wanted to do something social here. I, it took me a while to kind of figure out what I wanted to do uh, because I was trying to take a social interaction and turn that into an encounter. So here's what we're looking at here. And you can see my game notes uh, are really not very much. In essence, when the players walk in here, they see three ghosts that are chained up uh, with these sort of ghostly uh, chains. They're chained up with these ghostly chains, so descriptive, uh, to these three pillars. And in the center of the room is a, I didn't put it on the map, but there is a pillar with a uh, old school oblivion, you know, soul gym kind of thing, kind of vibe going on. And the ghosts all kind of knew what was going on. That's what I knew that I, because I didn't, I didn't want to like put descriptions on a tablet. I basically just wanted the ghosts to know what was going on to keep things moving along in the game. So here's what's going on. You have three different ghosts here. You have Dragon, the human vampire necromancer. And what happened to Dragon is that he says that his master and he were called to this place and his master was slain and he was in prison. Uh, that, that's actually what, what happened to him. So he was called to this place with his master and master was killed. He was imprisoned here, but he is a necromancer. And I wanted the players to pick up on that because the concept of this puzzle this encounter, if you will, is that each of the ghosts are going to say, hey, free me. Use the crystal to destroy the other two souls, and that will free me. And in exchange, I'm going to do something. Or not in exchange, I'm going to do something. So he actually was a necromancer, and I wanted the other two ghosts to know that. And the same thing goes for the fallen paladin and, uh, and the assassin. So all three of them, you have an assassin, a fallen paladin, and a necromancer. Not a lot of great choices if you're just casually going through a, a dungeon that's trying to kill you uh, when you come across this. Now, the last important thing is, is the players did not have to complete this room. This was a completely optional social challenge. If the players had walked just right past them and said, we can't figure out who's lying and, or not, and just left, that wouldn't have that wouldn't have stopped them at all. I would have absolutely 100% let them do that. And again, that goes back to that, just that little bit of nuance of choice. So you have the necromancer and uh, he tells, uh, if the players free him, he gives them information about the final encounter, about the final encounter up here. And so that's what he does. He kind of gives them a little bit of a, a boost of information. The fallen paladin, simply says, I was a servant of the light. And he just keeps going over and over and over with it. If the players free him, I had decided that he was just going to destroy a random magic item and poof out of there. I know, pretty tough, but, and it, I'm not saying you put that in every every campaign that might be be heartbreaking for some players. Uh, since this was a one shot and I knew, that, uh, I knew that my players were big boys and they could handle that, that's why I included that. And then finally we have the assassin up here who actually tells the player he was just hired to kill a wizard Things didn't go well, woke up here. Uh, but if they free him, he will give them a powerful magic item. Uh, and this is true. So I basically wanted to come up with a quick little magic item that uh, would actually be useful to the players, but also have a drawback. So we kind of have a good choice, a bad choice, and a, a sort of 
neutral choice here. And uh, this was a great encounter. It took the players a lot longer than what I thought it was going to take with the ghosts kind of arguing back and calling each other liars and stuff like that. And it was just a lot of fun. Uh, and by the way, this ring, this magic item, before I forget, uh, was going to give the players plus two, to whoever wore it, plus two to all saves, no attunement as soon as they slide it on. But the entire, all the undead that they encounter in the rest of the dungeon was just going to immediately beeline for that one player until they figured it out. So I thought that was uh, I thought that was a little bit of a fun a fun choice there. Uh, ultimately, my players uh, they they picked wonderfully. They totally got it. Uh, they they picked up on all the clues that I was dropping. They actually freed the necromancer, the vampiric necromancer, and he gave them information uh, about destroying about defeating the final boss. And uh, I don't, it couldn't have worked out any better. They they just absolutely did a wonderful job there. So. Let's move up here to the next room. Now, this next room is an encounter I wanted to include uh, to because I, I wanted it to not be overly difficult. I wanted it to take some time to continue on with the themes of the dungeon and uh, basically just be a, hey, we're going to do we're going to go through this and push through this uh, type of encounter without a lot of a, a lot of a lot of a time sink. Really, that, that's what I wanted to do. So in this room it was very simple. Big, clean, and open. In the middle here is a statue. Uh, the sta that's it. That's all that's in here. That's all that's in the room. And I continued on with the theme. Hey, this seems like there's no, there's no, nothing ornate. There's no story going on. Again, all the story was going on with Lor Lemire, who created this as a test for his uh, test for his sons. So, when the players went in here, door slams behind them. It's very simple. This turns into a uh, CR10 stone golem. They got to fight the stone golem. But every uh, every round, at the beginning of the round, I had the lights totally turn off. So the players fought in complete darkness. Whether they had dark vision or not, it was basically a magical darkness. And that is uh, that in increased the challenge here a little bit. And then, of course, I had some shadows show up. Uh, I thought shadows were a good complement to the big stone golem, uh, be specifically because they deal strength damage and because they're a little bit... Uh, you know, it's just a different vibe. It's not often you're going to find shadows pop up alongside uh, a stone golem. And I thought that was kind of a nice little twist to, to make that. So what I really liked about this is even though I said every round, I did it kind of halfway through the round. So as the first round started, the players started moving in and taking their actions and getting their attacks in. And then halfway through, as the next player was readying their action, the lights went out. And the lights went all the way out back around until there it was their turn again so it kind of mixed things up a little bit here and it, it made the players kind of give them that just a little bit of a heightened sense of okay we got to be careful we don't know how this works and so it made every one of their actions more important because they can't just make their get into position now thinking that they're going to make their attack next round because they don't know if the lights are going to go off again and uh, fighting in complete darkness was a lot of fun for them. They handled this pretty handily. It wasn't anything uh, terrible. So then the players cross back over here. Uh, I thought about putting a trap here. Because of the time, I went ahead and, and I, I just kind of figured, hey, we're not going to have time to do this. And so what, what they did is they moved in here into this next room, into the intellect hall. Let me show you guys this. This is one of my favorite encounters. Uh, I've used this encounter about four or five times in different games through, over the years, and I've, I've mixed up the the combatants combatants uh, a few times. So when they walk into this room, they see these these coffins right all over the room, and then in the middle of the room is another stone golem because they'd already fought the stone golem. They they have a, a good idea about what's going to happen, but here in the middle of the table or middle of the room is a table. And let me kind of just slide down here so you guys can see this. So this table is a simple Tower of Hanoi challenge. If you guys don't know what that is, uh, it's basically you have to take the pegs or take the, the rings is how I describe this and get them all over here in this exact order on this side. The trick and catch is, is that you cannot stack any larger on top of a smaller one. So you, you have to keep them in the correct size when you're placing them down. So if I wanted to put this one here, then I gotta put this one here. Now, this is a, a pretty famous challenge. You've seen it in a few video games. If you've uh, played, I think Half-Life had it. Um, I think, uh, maybe not Half-Life. 
uh, maybe something else. Uh, I know it's been in a, a lot of different video games. I know it was in KOTOR back in the day. So this is a very simple and clean challenge. What I liked about this and why I continue to use this challenge and why I actually recommend it is because it is in fact a puzzle, but it is a puzzle. Typically when you, when you give your group a puzzle, what they do is, is one or two people solves the puzzle and everybody else stands around. And that's bad encounter design. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that everybody at the table feels like they're doing something, that they're contributing to solving this room. So this is very simple and, and easy. Each player can make two moves around. The Tower of Hanoi actually has a calculator because there's four rings. I knew that it, I believe it took 15 moves if they did it exactly right uh, to solve. And what I like about this is that if they, as they're solving this, every round, two of these undead creatures are gonna start popping up here. So what I included was, I included some just CR3 mummies. I have a specter, which I believe is um, a CR1, a CR, a challenge rating one. And then I added some skeletal warriors. Now I did do a little tweaking to the skeletons. Uh, typically they only have uh, 13 AC and 13 hit points. I, I didn't even mess with any of that. I just kept them with the same short sword. Uh, I just cranked their life up to 37 and their armor class up to 16 to give them a little bit of a bit more of a crunch because my players were level 10. So this is a great encounter. The attackers come from all sides. The attackers target all sorts of different people. Sometimes they have to, they go up and they try to attack the person that's working the puzzle while they have their back to them. Uh, and so it created a lot of chaos and stuff going around the room. And in addition to that, you still had the stone golem. So I really, really, really liked this encounter. I was very pleased with how it played out. We had Andrew Armstrong's character Volk, who could take the most damage because he was a barbarian. He was a barbarian paladin. Uh, he came up here. He, he started immediately engaging into the golem, seeing that as the biggest threat in the room. Uh, I had two players fighting off all the rest of the undead as they continued to sprout up. And then I had one player working the puzzle, which was uh, Jordan with Forgotten Realms explained. This encounter ran so, so, so smoothly. Uh, it just it just turned out perfectly. Uh, now I will make a quick little observation here. I ran this encounter in the past where it did not have a timer on it in essence, basically, Every time there was, instead of coffins, I ran this with a bunch of Mephit statues and the players would kill the Mephits and then the Mephits would f kind of fizzle back from the sand, crawl across the room back into statue form. And so uh, it was basically an infinite loop. And then I had two players trying to work the puzzle at the same time as this and uh, they were working against each other. And so, yeah, that was the first time I ran this puzzle and I really had a group just not pass it. Uh, and that, that became a little bit of an issue. So I will warn you that if you're going to use a similar puzzle like this with the Tower of Hanoi, give it a, a finite countdown. Uh, there were plenty of enemies here. There was a, a lot of threats going on. And when they killed the golem, the undead did not die like they did in the previous room. When they killed the golem and solved the puzzle, that's when all the rest of the undead died. But... If all of them just said, let's just clear out the room and then we'll work the puzzle, totally and completely a valid way to do this. Uh, it might just have end up spawning more, uh, more enemies for them. So let's go back over here to the tomb. And then down here, I knew I wanted to just have a little bit of fun and uh, because this was a one shot, it's for a charity. This was some, some YouTube buddies. Uh, let's just be a little cheeky here. And uh, so I included a little, little secret room that Laura Lemire left as a treasure trove for his kids. And again, I continue to use this to reinforce the theme of the dungeon. When the players discovered this room and they moved aside this panel, Laura Lemire's ghost popped back up as a message. Sons, you're, you've great keen eyes and that will serve you well. Inside the chest, you will find items that will help you, blah, blah, blah. And so this was, this was nice. It, it eliminated the time of the players being like, oh, I'm gonna check it for traps. Oh no, I'm gonna do this and this and this and this and freak out about it and panic. Uh, they 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 got it, they got it right away. They're like, okay, we kind of are understanding the theme of the dungeon as of what's going on. Uh, and then every time Laura Lemire left, he said, your mother would be proud. So I wanted to continue to re reinforce those dungeon themes. And in here I put a plus two bow, which nobody used, and a sunblade, which nobody used. Okay. <laughs> 
Seriously, I put, I put a couple of magic items in there and nobody used it. Now, these challenges here are a little bit more level appropriate, right? My players are 10. This is a CR 10. We got some shadows going on. Nothing, nothing amazing. Uh, we got a CR 10 with a bunch of smaller things. Nothing amazing. The players were able to handle that pretty well. And I wanted to give them a chance to rest in this dungeon, which I believe they did take. Uh, I can't remember. I, I think they rested uh, before they moved on to the final encounter. Now, where as balanced as these are, and then the social encounter has been, all this stuff has been, I knew that for the finale, what I wanted to do is I wanted to just throw all the CRs out the window. It doesn't matter. This is a dungeon designed uh, for a purpose, whether or not they are appropriate level for that. And I know there's a little bit of, of cheating here. So I, I came up with a theme here for undead mummies. I thought that would be really cool. I thought that would be, be an interesting twist here that uh, Laura Lemire would challenge his sons by trapping these un or these mummified hags, excuse me, I said undead mummies, mummified hags here. And so I thought this was a, was a great mashup here of the hag and the mummy. And I thought that they, they did a lot of similar things and it took me a little bit of tweaking to add to it. So let me kind of just describe to you what I did here. Made there, made a little custom token there. So we'll kind of look at this mummy hag. Uh, this is not polished, okay? This is not polished at all. This was kind of hastily thrown together. So I started with a night hag uh, because night hags and covens go from a CR5 to a CR7. Uh, seven, if I, if I remember correctly. And then uh, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to take the best bits of each of these and infuse them together. So whereas the hags typically only do slashing damage, I think their, their physical attacks are pretty weak. I wanted to give them rotting fist and dreadful glare. Uh, and then for the spell casting, I completely handpicked my coven list here. Uh, let me, here we go. This is what I want to show you. So I completely customized this uh, this hag list here for the coven. So I wanted to stay really heavy in the themes of necrotic to kind of reinforce those that theming. We have inflict wounds, ray of sickness, whole person, mind spike, bestow cursed, counterspell. Counterspell is something that I almost always try to include on my villains. I think it is. Uh, I just it's just one of my favorite things to include, especially when players just think, okay, we're going to group them up tight and throw a big AOE and we're going to just nuke them down. Uh, so counterspell is something I always like to include there. Uh, lightning bolt, which I believe they fired off a couple of lightning bolts, which was very devastating. Uh, Phantasmal killer. We took the new shadow of the moil contact other plane just to, to not overload them too much with the damaging spells uh, contagion and then circle of death. And again, these are all shared. These are, this is a shared spell list. So, uh, for the actual hag casting for the innate casting, uh, I did a little tweaking here. So we took kind of an essence of, of the night hag to, to kind of get the basic stats for this thing. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to do that for their casting. I don't like their spell list. And so I grabbed a, a beer hag kind of, and then I kind of, and then I took uh, from three a day and one a day to two and two. And then I, all I did was I just reflavored some of the spells. So instead of ice knife, I gave them sand knife. Instead of cone of cold, I gave them cone of sand. And then instead of ice storm, I gave them sand storm. Uh, and these were devastating. These are really, these are big AOEs. Uh, I gave the players plenty of room, plenty of room in this to maneuver and hide behind these big columns and try to get out of, of these big AOEs, at least spread out. And they all pretty much grouped right around here. So, uh, uh, yeah, it was pretty devastating for the players. Now, the last thing I did here is something I've talked about before that my younger brother came up with when I was, uh, when we were, uh, fighting some hags of his. And that was to basically give these guys, uh, a regenerating, life to increase their challenge rating. So very simple in the middle here, you got your, your little cauldron. You have these, uh, sarcophagus sarcophagi, I guess is the plural of that. I'm not sure. And that there's these glowing skulls. So when we go back to our social encounter and the players freed the necromancer, he gave them information. He said, the secret to defeating the sisters is in the skulls. And so the players, I gave them basically one round as they walk into this room, the door slams behind them, and then 
the sand is starting to kick up. I gave them a free round, and they did exactly what they should have done. They, with armed with the good information off of good roleplay choices, they started immediately attacking the skulls. And so uh, I think all in all, the skulls only regenerated one hag. Uh, they destroyed the rest of them. And by the way, by the time they destroyed the skulls, it was over. They tore through the rest of the hags. Uh, they tore through them uh, very, very, very quickly. So uh, each of these skulls, I think I gave an ar armor class of 16 and a health pool of 40 points of damage. And so, yeah, absolutely. They came in. They started wrecking the skulls. Uh, the one time that the hag went down before a skull was dropped, uh, dropped the skull basically shattered and exploded. And a big pool came out from this blood cauldron and basically encompassed her and brought her back up at full health all in all it was a ton of fun we went a little bit over our three hour window that we wanted to and i hope it is my hope and intention that uh, that game will actually end up here on the channel so that you guys can watch it because the audience they were so determined to give me the uh the tools necessary to kill these to kill these guys and to kill these players and so i ended up dropping one permanently uh, that was Yabo, Jim Davis's character. So I ended up killing his character. I kind of teased him a little bit about it while we were on the stream. And I was like, yes, I got your character. And so uh, it was a tremendous amount of fun. But hopefully uh, that will give you guys some ideas and spark some, some, some ideas. You guys can see some of my thought process here uh, as far as trying to make sure that there's social encounters, trying to make sure that uh, you have, you're telling a story even with your cheap little fun puzzle dungeon and then when you are coming up with uh, when you are coming up with puzzle with puzzles to throw at your players that you're turning them into full encounters that everybody at the table can participate in. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Let me know what you guys think. Did you guys like this? Did you hate it? Was this something you guys want to see more of? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then if you guys have any fun puzzles, I always love reading about puzzles. Be sure to leave those down in the comments below. If this is your first time here, by the way, uh, let me just let you know that every week I put out new videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if this is your first time here, I'd love to have you subscribe. If that sounds like stuff that you might be interested in, just hit that subscribe button down below and uh, come hang out with us. Also, we've, we're, we've got a Discord going with almost 700 people in there. We've got the Facebook community going. And uh, yeah, just a whole lot going on. But uh, that's it. That's all for me. So uh, until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. My name is Cody, and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. Take care. Yeah.